and the groupers are moving to another reef. So it was a very sad story for a beautiful, intriguing fish. And it got me very, very uh, enthusiastic about groupers from then. The other thing that got me really curious about groupers was, although I saw spawning of other fishes every day, I never actually saw these spawn. I saw the aggregations, but I never saw them spawn. So throughout the world, there are 167 species of grouper. And this map you can see, so the red is where the highest numbers are, and the blue is where the lowest numbers are. And you can see the highest uh, diversity is in the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, and that's pretty common for most uh, taxa of fish. Although there's 167 species, we might be changing that number. It's not actually a, a universally agreed upon number. Uh, we might find some more species of grouper. And that's not because we'll find things we've never seen before, but we might recognize that the things that we see are actually more than one species. And that happened with the Goliath grouper. So the Goliath grouper um, has a distribution in this part of the world. It's also on uh, the Atlantic coast of Africa, and it's also on the Pacific coast of the Americas. And it looks, everywhere you see it, it looks exactly the same. But not that long ago, some people looked at the genetics and they concluded that it's at least two species of grouper. So now there's different species named for the Pacific grouper. Some people argue that there's actually more than two species, but they look exactly the same. Other interesting things to note about the global distribution of groupers. If you go to the, the Mediterranean region, about over 150 years ago, they opened the Suez Canal. And as they did that, fishes started to move from the Red Sea into the Mediterranean. And they found 80 different species of fish have done that so far. Six of them are species of grouper, and two of those species have actually established populations. So they're now functioning populations in the Mediterranean. There have been other introductions. So this beautiful grouper that's not supposed to be found uh, in Florida has been observed at six different locations on reef surveys as well, it's called the panther or humpback grouper, or if you're Australian, you probably call it the barramundi cod. And it's as a juvenile, it's, it's beautiful with big spots and it's very, very cute, but it grows quite quick, quickly. It will probably eat all the rest of your fish in your aquarium. So people tend to get rid of it. And that's why it's assumed to be uh, found because it's been uh, from aquarium releases. There's been some other introductions in the 1950s, um, uh, the government in Hawaii decided it was a really good idea to release a bunch of species to establish populations uh, for um, game and food. Uh, didn't turn out to be such a great idea. This grouper was introduced, so the peacock hind, and it's now uh, the most um, common meso predator found on reefs in Hawaii. Uh, it's effectively the lionfish of Hawaii. And just as you have lionfish derbies here, they have what they, they call this locally roy, and they have roy roundups. The only difference is you can't really eat it. Unfortunately, although in the rest of its range, it's a highly sought after fish, it's tasty, and people eat it. In Hawaii, it's got a very high incidence of ciguatera, so people don't tend to eat it. If you want to find out the how well a species is doing and its risk of extinction. If you go to this thing called the Red List, which is done by the International Union for Conservation of Nature, you can go online and you can put in a species name and it will tell you how well it's doing. It will tell. And if it's not doing very well, it might be critically endangered, such as the mountain gorilla, black rhino, Californian condor. It might be endangered, which is slightly less risk of extinction, like the blue whale, the brown kiwi, or the green sea turtle, vulnerable, like a polar bear, African elephant, lion, or near threatened, which means it's okay at the moment, but it's very likely to become one of the higher categories soon. Albacore tuna, jaguar, or monarch butterfly. And in 2020, they looked at all the species of grouper that they could and reevaluated uh, their levels of threats of extinction. And what they found was what they called elevated uh, species of elevated um, uh, conservation concerns, so either critically endangered, endangered, vulnerable, or near threatened. So one critically endangered, two endangered, 16 vulnerable, and eight near threatened. And what you'll notice by the map is the dark red bits are all in this part of the world. So the critically endangered species is NASA grouper. Other ones of elevated conservation concern, so it's Goliath grouper, DAG, 
uh, yellow mouth grouper, yellow edge grouper, snowy grouper, they're all species of elevated conservation concern, largely through fishing. And for the NASA grouper in particular, through fishing spawning aggregations. And although it looks particularly bad in this part of the world, it, it's probably also a factor that, that we have a lot of species that we don't know enough about to actually come to a conclusion. So, and most of those species will be found in the Indo-Pacific. So if you add all of that together, 16 to 31% of all group of species are elevated conservation concern. And as I mentioned, that's mostly from fishing, but there's also other things like habitat loss. Uh, the effect of climate change, we're really not sure what that's going to do, but it's probably not going to be very good. Um, so there's lots of things, lots of pressures on groupers. But we know what to do. We know what the solutions are. Uh, and we've had success stories. So you reduce the fishing pressure, such as the Goliath grouper for a while, no fishing, populations have recovered. Uh, you prevent uh, fishing on spawning aggregations by closing the season, such as the work that um, Reef and the Group of Moon projects have done in the Cayman Islands, uh, populations have recovered there. Uh, work in the US Virgin Islands has done the same thing. Um, creating marine protected areas in uh, the Mediterranean has, has done wonderful things for populations of groupers there. So we know what to do if we are able to do it. But unfortunately, the other pressure is uh, it's a very, very big global industry of fishing groupers. So on the uh, x-axis, you have uh, the year, and on the y-axis, you have how many thousand tons of grouper have been caught per year. And as you can see, it's just going up and up and up. And we've known they've been in trouble for quite some time, but still that level has been increasing. And so the level in 2020 equates to over 100 million, 100 million individuals of grouper fished a year. And it's a billion dollar industry, and sometimes grouper sells for over $100 per pound. So the, uh, the incentive to fish and not install those in, uh, conservation measures are, are very, very high. In uh, 2005, after I finished all my fun and games in Papua New Guinea, I moved to the Turks and Caicos Islands uh, to become a, a researcher in residence at a and lecturer in a, a conservation center. And I was amazed that there I found a critically endangered NASA grouper absolutely everywhere. So the species that the whole world was worried about, and uh, me in particular because of groupers, we swim in the seagrass beds and you'd find this uh, tiny little uh, juvenile there. There'd be hundreds of them. They'd be hiding in conch shells, which they particularly like. They'd be all over the seagrass. We, because we're scientists, we never leave anything alone. We pick them up and measure them, do all sorts of stuff. They'd be on patch reefs and they'd also be on uh, deeper reefs uh, as the bigger adults. And we thought this was pretty special, but we didn't know particularly how to compare that to it uh, anywhere else. And the only data that could tell us was actually reef data. So this was a, a graph I did back uh, from data from 2005 to 2015. And so the darker red it is, is the more likely you are to see a NASA grouper uh, on a dive. And the Turks and Caicos had the highest sighting frequency um, at So the reason that was given, uh, and we all believed, uh, of why NASA Group were doing so well in the Turks and Caicos was because although there were fish, the fisheries hadn't previously concentrated on reef fishes. They were concentrated for, for decades on spiny lobster on the right bottom and queen conch, which is on the left. So those are queen conch not in their shells. Uh, it's basically a, um, a slimy soup of mollusk that gets shoveled out of the boat. Delicious, nonetheless. Uh, and we didn't believe at the time that spawning aggregations had been heavily uh, targeted. So that's why populations were doing so well. And the main fishery in the Turks and Caicos Islands is spiny lobster. The other side of the fishing pressure is uh, it's quite a large amount of habitat, but only 250 commercial fishes. And only really 100 of those could be considered full time commercial fishes. 
So nonetheless, when we when we went to fishing docks, grouper would be there all the time. So there was definitely a fishing pressure. And it was uh, slightly worrying that 50% of everything fished was juvenile. And there was evidence that uh, aggregations were actually being fished and that the incidence of fishing aggregations was uh, increasing. In 2015, I, I was still in the Turks and Caicos Islands, but I became the director of the Department of Environment and Maritime Affairs. And one of the things that we managed to do as a sort of proactive measure was put in a closed season uh, for Nessa Grouper. We also put in a minimum size. So Grouper, we didn't exactly know the dates of when Grouper spawned in the Turks and Caicos Islands, but we assumed from comparing to other places that it was December, January, and February. So that was the closed season. And almost immediately after doing this, officers had some uh, strange questions. So they do, they do restaurant surveys where they find that people were serving grouper during the closed season, and they want to know what the grouper was to make sure it wasn't Nassau grouper. So in one particular restaurant, they went in and asked, is it Nassau grouper? And they said, we don't think so. Uh, don't really know what it is and showed them the box that they got, which was this. So Epinephalus is a genus of grouper. Uh, it's from Mexico. I blurred out the bit in the middle because it's actually a supplier from Florida. Um, and, but we have no idea what species it is. So we couldn't charge them, didn't want to charge them, but it was uh, no idea. Another thing that started happening was we kept uh, hearing that white grouper was being served, locally caught fresh white grouper. And we'd never, for 10 years, we've been studying landings at the dock, and we'd never heard of a fisherman referring to a white grouper. So we thought that most probably it was a NASA grouper like this being turned white, which is um, quite often how locally they prepare the meat. But we had no way of, of looking at it uh, as fillets. Uh, so we had no way of telling whether there was um, compliance with the law or not. Another thing that we, um, we noticed was that uh, back in 2024, sorry, back in 2014, uh, parrotfish had been banned. Uh, and I'm sure most of you know that parrotfish are crucially important to reefs as grazers. So to get rid of too much algae and allow corals to, to thrive. So the Turks and Caicos Islands managed to ban fishing for parrotfish in 2014. But we did know that fishermen were still periodically catching parrotfish. Uh, and we assumed that it was being sold as, as a grouper. Another thing that we noticed was uh, Grouper was on every, pretty much every menu you could find. And there was a particular emphasis on um, fresh local grouper. So things named like Caicos grouper, South Caicos grouper. Um, and we couldn't believe that the amount of grouper being sold could have been produced by the local fisheries. And it, back in 2001, there was a study, uh, so 20 years before we, we did uh, this study, uh, where they estimated that 40% of all groupers sold in restaurants in the Turks and Caicos Islands was actually imported from Southeast Asia and uh, Central America. So in that 20 years, the number of local fishermen had actually decreased. Probably the populations of grouper had decreased locally. Uh, and on top of that, the population of residents had doubled and the number of visitors to the islands had increased by a factor of 10. So you add all of those things together and it's almost inconceivable that all of this fresh grouper uh, was actually being sold. So we thought that there was a lot of seafood fraud going on, but at the time, uh, there wasn't a lot we could do about it um, until two years later when we, uh, we were able to conduct a study. So we thought there was seafood fraud and we knew that seafood fraud was actually quite uh, quite common throughout the world. And it came to the world's consciousness and particularly America's consciousness uh, through the work of Oceana back in 2013, when they did a study of things sold in restaurants and in stores. And they concluded that 33% of every seafood product in the US sold was mislabeled, which is an absolutely phenomenal statistic. Uh, a few years later, a different study uh, with a similar techniques, but a much a more sophisticated way of calculating the statistics. Uh, they did the same thing and they, they found, they revised it down to 27%, which is still pretty high. And they looked globally and 8% uh, of seafoods uh, globally was mislabeled. 
And these are astronomical statistics. The US is the largest importer of seafood in the world. And seafood is one of the uh, most highly traded global commodities as well, with 8% being basically fraudulent at some stage. Uh, so it's an enormous problem. And grouper mislabeling is one of the biggest components of that problem. Well, at least the incidence of mislabeling in grouper is one of the highest uh, mislabeling rates for uh, different groups of fishes. So if you look at that, those what's wrapped up in those statistics more closely, uh, which um, uh, my wife, Marta Colosso, and our colleagues uh, did, um, we found that in all of the studies, and there were 18 studies across four continents, over 50% of the, the species who were, which were implicated in the mislabeling were actually two species. There were the Nile perch and the Asian striped catfish, two um, freshwater farmed fishes. There were a bunch of other species too, but those were the, over 50% were those two. And the obvious incentive for that is they're very, very cheap. Group is expensive. If you can sell something cheap for a good price, you're making a lot of money. And uh, a lot of customers uh, apparently uh, can't tell. So when we got uh, the collaboration, we, we were able to, to start this study. We had um, two experts um, doing the DNA for us. And our job was collecting the samples. So we went to restaurants in Turks and Caicos Islands, and we uh, ordered grouper as many times as we could. And we also went to uh, the stores and found as much grouper uh, for sale as we could which got very expensive very quickly. The, the fillet soles in the stores were over $50 a pound, so that's not great. And things in the Turks and Caicos are very expensive anyway, uh, but grouper dinners are, are particularly expensive. It was mostly enjoyable. There were some algae meals, I have to say. And this is what we found. So we bought grouper, so it was sold as white grouper, grouper, local grouper, and black grouper. Well, what we found was 57% was the Asian striped catfish. We found 25% were actually snappers, uh, mostly Cubera snapper, but also the lavender jobfish, which is an Indo-Pacific species. We did find 18% were actually grouper. Um, but only one of those was labeled correctly. So only the uh, greasy grouper, which was simply labeled grouper, was labeled correctly. The others, so two labeled as local grouper, were actually from the Indo-Pacific. Another one called black grouper was actually the Malabar grouper. And there was another one we couldn't identify to species, species but because of the genus that we could identify, uh, we knew it wasn't what it said it was. So that's uh, pretty horrific. Only one out of all of our samples was actually not mislabeled. And when we compared all the other studies uh, on a group of mislabeling, so there, there are not too many studies that just focus on group of mislabeling, there are a lot of studies that have grouper in them. So when we found the statistics in those from North America, Central America, South America, Europe, and the rest of the world, and we lined them all up in order and we added our study, we were number one. We had the highest mislabeling rate in the world of 96 percent and then what we wanted to understand was uh, um, who was responsible for this so along the supply chain from the fisher or farmer in the case of uh, the asian catfish you have the processors you have intermediaries and those can be more than one step so they can have the exporters importers etc stores and markets uh, restaurants, and then onto the consumer. And overwhelmingly, what we concluded was that in the Turks and Caicos, the restaurants were the perpetrators and the consumers were obviously the victims. Um, we couldn't exclude uh, processes and intermediaries, but they, um, it was almost, the more we looked into it, a, um, an open secret that it was happening. And uh, the other thing we concluded was, although we thought local fishers would be um, part of the problem, we thought they were going to be selling Nassau grouper during closed seasons. We thought they were going to be selling uh, parrotfish as grouper. Um, we didn't find any evidence that they were doing anything wrong. Uh, and that's actually quite, um, quite common in uh, studies on mislabeling, that 
practitioners are generally not to blame for uh, seafood fraud. And in fact, they are one of the victims. So when there's uh, a seafood mislabeling, when there's substitutions, fishers have to compete against cheap important, uh, imported uh, fraudulent substitutions. So you can't really compete with the price of um, the Asian striped catfish, which comes in other names of swa, swai, sushi catfish, uh, and, and a whole bunch of other things. It's very, very cheap. Uh, same as tilapia. Um, and so it suppresses what we refer to as ex vessel prices. So what a fisherman can get for his catch, what he should be getting should be much higher. But if someone can substitute it for uh, a freshwater farm species, uh, they have to reduce their, um, their prices. It also eliminates consumer confidence. So Having, if you know now that 96% of every grouper meal in the Turks and Caicos Islands is actually not grouper, do you want to be buying grouper? So it, it's, it um, reduces uh, consumer confidence. The other thing that we recognize, it actually jeopardizes management of groupers. If you have a system where grouper appears to be absolutely everywhere, there's, there's, real, there's no public incentive to do anything about the management. You don't perceive that there's a problem because you can go to any restaurant and find grouper. You can go to any supermarket and find grouper. Um, you go to the dock and you'll see fishermen fishing grouper. You'll go to the sea and there's, there's grouper. It's, it undermines the, the need or the perceived need for uh, management of groupers. There's also a lot of other things that can be wrapped up in mislabeling. Mislabeling or seafood fraud is, is another way of, well, another thing that happened is a way of laundering illegal product. So this is a vessel, a 100-foot vessel uh, called the Capitan Blaze, which came, uh, worked out of the Dominican Republic. And in 2017, it was found fishing in the Turks and Caicos Islands um, illegally. It had 16 um, tenders. Each of those tenders had um, hooker gear in it, so a compressor and uh, a diver uh, underwater. They fished in shifts basically 24 hours a day. There'd be a night shift and a day shift. And these are the moment they were arrested. And amongst, they caught 40,000 pounds of fish. They were only fishing for 10 days. Uh, we, we worked that out from the, the GPS track. Uh, and in that 10 days, they caught 40,000 pounds of fish and eight and a half thousand pounds of that were grouper. And they would have all ended up in the supply chain somewhere and they were illegally caught uh, in, by people who weren't allowed to catch it in a place they weren't allowed to catch it through a technique that wasn't allowed to be used. You can't fish on uh, compressed air in the Turks and Caicos Islands. So there's that side of it. So mislabeling is a way of, of laundering stuff. But it's also, there's another side. So this vessel, um, the uh, 42 crew lived in horrific conditions. Uh, they're diving. Uh, on hooker, it's not a, a compressor designed for hooker diving. I think it's a compressor designed for spray painting cars or whatever. There's no air filter on it whatsoever. Uh, people aren't diving to any sort of tables. Uh, when we talked to the, the fishermen, uh, many of them complained of things that were symptoms like decompressing sickness. Um, there were others who told stories about uh, their colleagues who, who were not very well after it. And in the photo before, when you saw people getting rested, you, um, you probably couldn't see, but some of them were very, very young. Uh, there weren't any children in this group, but we had in the past um, detained uh, poaching vessels when there were uh, children 14 years old was the youngest, and it wasn't uncommon for them to be 16 years old. So you could be ordering grouper that was caught illegally by people in, um, who were fishing in horrific conditions. And human rights and fisheries is becoming a very, very big topic uh, particularly as it's uncovered that there's um, forced labor in, in a number of fisheries throughout the world, particularly uh, being uncovered in Thai fisheries. But when we talked to some of these, uh, some of the younger people in here, they didn't know where they were, they didn't know when they were going to go home, and they didn't know if they were going to get paid. So uh, there's a lot of things that can be tied up in the mislabeling equation. So on that depressing note, what can we do about it? Well, there are things we can do about it. Um, the, the key is to increase uh, traceability throughout the supply chain. And um, there's lots of organizations that, that are working on that. 
Uh, in the Turks and Caicos example, it's probably uh, not going to be possible for them to get something like the uh, Marine Stewardship Council certification, the blue tick, because it's actually quite expensive process to do. Uh, but certainly things that have that have a very good uh, uh, traceability. So you can, uh, and a lot of other uh, initiatives that um, have labeling that guarantee the integrity of the product. Uh, so examples here from Dr. Dish, Friends of the Sea, uh, SALT, the Seafood Alliance for uh, Legality and Traceability. They're trying to instigate more electronic means of doing this. And there are other organizations that, that are trying to instigate um, blockchain in order to trace uh, the seafood from the moment it's caught to wherever it ends up. So blockchain is the same, same technology used for um, cryptocurrency. So essentially in every transaction that you have with that, uh, there's this digital footprint of what's happened that can't be changed. And so various ways of trying to um, incorporate that in the seafood chain. It is unfortunately quite expensive. So it's it's uh, it would be out of reach for many of the small scale fishers in uh, certainly Turks and Caicos Islands uh, in the Indo-Pacific as well. It requires some industrial scale for it to be uh, to, to work like that. But things where you where you have uh, on a smaller scale, if you know this restaurant is fishing from this fisherman and he goes to this place and you have that trust uh, that can be built and a sort of storied seafood uh, that can be relied upon, uh, there are ways that you can eliminate um, uh, seafood mislabeling. But it's very, very difficult currently because there's so much money involved. It's such a big industry and there are so many, uh, so many black boxes along the way of where we don't have the data of what's happening and who has it and where it's gone and what's happened to it. Particularly when a, a big fish turns into multiple little bits that end up going somewhere else. It's, uh, it's, it's very, very hard. But there's a lot of work being done on it and there's been a lot of progress. So hopefully America's statistic of 27% of everything being mislabeled will consistently go down. Uh, but uh, at the moment, it's, it's an enormous problem. And I think that's my, my 35 minutes up. So thank you. Any questions? Oh. How can we put pressure on our local grocery stores to behave responsibly? Well, I, they're not going to do, well, they're not going to sell things that people aren't going to buy. So there's that sort of economic side of things. Um, one of the problems that we had in the Turks and Caicos is that you can label anything however you want. You can call, and there's no, there's no law to say that I could, I could catch a grouper and I could call it the fantastic red grouper and that would be absolutely fine. There are, there are laws here where you, I uh, presume, need to have a specific name for a product that you're selling. Um, how... There are other things that you can demand to know more about what that seafood is. I'm horrified every time I go to a restaurant or a supermarket and I don't know where that comes from. So if I ask the serving staff, so where did your where did your fish come from? And I don't know, the kitchen. It's not a good sign. So uh, being able to, to put pressure on to understand the rest of the, the supply chain. Not just that it's it's fresh, it's good quality, but but where on earth it came from. And there's in Europe. I, I'm sorry, I'm very ignorant to what's happening in in the states. But in Europe, there's a lot of that is is happening, and there's a lot more information that's uh, either mandated or voluntarily um, uh, given by people in supermarkets supplying those things. Is there a question here? Yeah, when you did your study in Kirks and Caicos, did you um, find that the grocery store was any different than, because you said it was mostly the restaurants were lying. Was it the grocery stores lying too? Well, uh, probably. We, we um, unfortunately, the samples we got from, from the grocery stores, uh, many of them, when we ran the, the, uh, the DNA analysis, they had degraded too much to tell. But we, we were very sure that the things that they were labeling. There's a lot of black grouper um, being sold and we've never seen a black grouper, well, maybe one at the fishing dock. 
it's not something that's commonly caught. So there's a lot of that being being mislabeled. Um, and that was particularly during the closed season for, for NASA grouper. But we we assumed it was mislabeling, but we, but we couldn't prove it. Uh, yes, uh, Dr. Caden, did you do an NPR um, thing on the radio at one point in time? Uh, no, no. It, it all Sorry. sounds familiar. There was something like that. Thanks for the talk, John. Uh, I use a bunch of this information actually in my sustainable seafood class that I teach. I think one of the other things that it's important to point out about the mislabeling that came out of that Oceana study of particular relevance to Florida is that they found that two of the species that were being mislabeled as grouper were king mackerel and golden tilefish. And those are two of the very top to avoid as far as methylmercury content is concerned. And so there are actually not just human rights, but human health issues associated with some of this mislabeling as well that people should be aware of. And like you pointed out, that's why it's really important to know what your supply chain is. Yeah, that, that's a great point. One of the things that we, we thought we were going to see was um, species that people generally avoid. And in the, in the Turks and Caicos Islands, they don't generally eat tiger grouper. And if, uh, um, they presume that there's more incidents of food poisoning from that, from ciguatera and other things. And we assumed that we'd find that laundered as, as other species. And uh, yeah, the, the other side of, of, of the health thing is in the Texas Kickers Islands, the, the pictures I had, you'd see all the fish, never seen uh, an ice cube in its life, uh, usually left out in the sun. Uh, sometimes they'll put something in the shade on the top. And uh, at least that, you know, it's they fish. They don't stay out very long in a day and come back. So even if it's been out in the sun all day, it's probably still quite good quality. But the less you know about the seafoods that you're eating, the, the less you know about the quality, the health risks associated, what it's been through, how many times it's been uh, defrosted, refrozen, left in the sun, flies have been removed from it. You just don't know. It's uh, there is the 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 benefits to understanding the steps that you're that you're going something you're going to eat comes to you is. Uh, there's multiple, whether it's for the species itself or for your, for your own health or ethical reasons, as I mentioned before. There's a grouper on every menu we've been seeing in every restaurant we've been in here locally. Uh, it's unspecified. What is it and where is it from? That, that's a very good question. I When I saw it in the restaurant last night that we went to, I won't mention his name, but it was very nice what I had. Uh, the grouper, I presumed, was black grouper, but I'm not sure. I'd have to ask someone locally. Is there anyone who could answer that question? So related to your DNA testing, is that getting cheaper, easier to do, so that as surveys are done, more can be learned? Uh, yes. And specifically for, for grouper, there's... Um, I wish I could remember the names of the, of the scientists that developed this, but they've uh, developed a very quick and easy kit to identify if it is grouper, not what species it is, but if something is, is grouper, because it's a particularly big problem in Florida. Uh, so I was curious what would be your response would be to kind of the, maybe it's an economics question, but what is the opportunity cost if you could snap your fingers and suddenly there's no more mislabeling in Turks and Caicos? It sounds like you're describing an unbelievable demand for local hot fish that I assume probably exceeds what maybe the ecosystem could support. Would that not essentially be a ban on restaurants being able to serve a lot of these species? And is that even politically viable in a place like that? It's, it's, it was, that's was actually something I was going to touch on a little bit was whether, so for the species, if you're actually mislabeling grouper for Asian striped catfish, maybe that's good for grouper. Uh, but in, in the broader, in the context of being able to manage things um, and get incentivize uh, local regulations to protect groupers, it compromises that. But for, for groupers in general, might be a good thing. 
um, if I snapped my fingers and nothing was mislabeled, uh, then we probably uh, the good side of it would be that the fresh locally caught grouper would probably have a much higher price. Fisherman would benefit because it would be perceived to be more scarce because it actually really is. And then there'd be an honesty about the imported groupers coming in. And uh, what you're having in your fish taco is some farmed catfish or tilapia or whatever. And that's why it's so cheap. Uh, so I, I'm not sure it's it's going to drive more fishing of grouper necessarily. We can manage that. Um, it might be a better way of, of making more um, sustainable livelihoods for, for fishers. So I, I don't see it as, as the end result being catastrophic for groupers because it means that there's going to be so many more locally caught. Um, I think it, it means that there's, there'll be an honesty about everything else that's imported. There's, um, yeah, there's, uh, most of the seafood in the Turks and Caicos Islands is, is imported. The, the fishery, like I said, there's only probably a hundred full-time fishers there's there's only so much damage they can do, and most of the the, um, the fishing is focused on on lobster and queen queen conch. Yes, uh, one question is uh, concerning everything considering everything you understand about this problem. Is it a practical? Is it practical just to simply order a well seasoned tilapia and avoid the whole issue? Um, yeah, I. It's not. Uh, I mean. Some people complain if you know what you're eating and and that's what you ordered, then absolutely no problem. Tilapia is not not a not a terrible fish. Swai, uh, the um, Asian striped catfish. I mean, there's a reason why it's substituted because it it has similar consistency. It's got firm flesh. It's versatile. Um, there may be some problems with how those things are farmed. I don't know too much about it, but I I presume that's not as big a problem. There's another question over there. Thank you, Doctor, for a very good talk. Is there any consequence to mislabeling? Is it illegal, or if somebody's caught mislabeling fish, what happens? Um, in this country, yes, <laughs> uh, it, it's illegal. Well, it's, it's fraud, and in Turks and Caicos Islands, theoretically, it's um, it's illegal. Uh, I very much doubt anyone would be. Um, be taken to court for it but there's uh and there's there's been in the u.s some some pretty high profile cases of, of mislabeling being prosecuted things i think some restaurants have been done but others sort of further back in the supply chain i know there was um not for grouper but for salmon there was a supplier who uh, imported a whole bunch of salmon that was farmed in chile repackaged it as coming from a, a lovely lock in scotland and sold it off and uh, got uh, fined quite a hefty amount for that. So there, there definitely are consequences. It's probably not yet in the Turks and Caicos Islands. Um, okay, I think that's, uh, thank you very much, John. Thank you. About his experiences. Thank you. <laughs>